California, Columbia presents William Shakespeare's tragedy of Julius Caesar. With tonight's all-star production of Julius Caesar, the Columbia Network brings you the third in this summer's cycle of eight Shakespearean plays to be presented at the same time every Monday night during July and August. Each of these plays has been especially adapted for a full hour radio presentation. And in each, the world's most distinguished actors will join Columbia in bringing the works of this immortal dramatist to millions of people who have never had the opportunity of enjoying them before. In tonight's performance of Julius Caesar, a stellar cast of 60 is headed by Claude Rains as Cassius, Thomas Mitchell as Brutus, Walter Abel as Casca, and Reginald Denny as Caesar. Columbia regrets to announce that Mr. Raymond Massey, who was originally cast in the role of Anthony, was suddenly stricken ill this morning and will be unable to appear. Morris Ancrum, young actor and director of the New York stage, will play the part of Anthony. Victor Bay, Columbia's talented young conductor, raises his baton to lead the orchestra in the musical introduction. And as the curtain rises, Conway Turrell, well-known actor of stage and screen, comes forward as narrator to set the stage for the first scene of Julius Caesar. Rome. When Rome was the world, and Caesar was the mightiest Roman, Caesar the conqueror, Caesar the lawgiver, Wise Caesar, vain Caesar, brilliant Caesar, superstitious Caesar. Tomorrow he will be dead, but today he lives, and the world is his for the taking. Today is the Roman festival of the Lupercal. In a few moments, the sons of noblemen will run naked through the streets, striking all whom they meet with leather thongs. In this manner will they symbolize for the gods the purification of the city. All Rome will line the course to witness the holy race. And none more prominent than Caesar with his wife, Calpurnia, and his train of followers. For Caesar makes a point of appearing publicly on such occasions. He is the idol of the Republic. The servile Senate would like to make him king, but Caesar bides his time. Here he comes now to the festive crowd, a striking figure in his white toga. Surrounded by the chief statesmen of the Republic, by flatterers, by sycophants, by the curious. Calpurnia. Peace, ho! Caesar! Calpurnia. Dear my lord. Stand you directly in Antonius' way when he doth run his course. Antonius! Caesar, my lord! Forget not in your speed, Antonius, to touch Calpurnia. For our elders say the baron touch it in this holy chase. Shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember. When Caesar says, do this... It is performed. Set on, and leave no ceremony out. Caesar! 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 I hear a tongue, shriller than all the music, cries Caesar. Speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the eyes of March. What man is that? A soothsayer. Did you beware the eyes of March? <laughs> he is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. The mighty Caesar and his train of followers <clears throat> move forward to the races. But two men linger behind. This one, broad of brow and thoughtful of countenance, is Brutus. Statesman and scholar. Scion of a noble and illustrious family. Ardent believer in the Republic. That one is Cassius. God. Hawk-like, passionately patriotic, but personally envious and avaricious. Cassius speaks obliquely with one eye on the receding figure of Caesar. Lucas, will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. 
If I have failed my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil perhaps to my behaviors. But let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one, nor constitute any further my neglect than that poor Brutus with himself at war forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine has buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitation. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other thing. It is just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what danger would you lead me, Cassius, that you'd have me seek for myself for that which is not in me? What means that shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for the king. I do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other. And I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me. As I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not be, as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point upon the word. Accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point proposed. Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear. So from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but not on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan. I and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink, Titanius, as a sick girl. He, God, it doth amaze me, a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Another general shout. I do believe these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on sea. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? There was a Brutus once that would have broke the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. But you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. For this present, I would not, so with love I might entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear. And find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much sure fire from Brutus. The games are done. 
and Caesar is returning. As they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what has proceeded. Were they no today? I will do so. But look, you Cassius, the angry spot that glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chin train. Casca will tell us what the matter is. Now Caesar's chariot enters the public square, hemmed in by the adoring multitude. Caesar, sharp-eyed and suspicious, has noted the withdrawal of Cassius and Brutus. He motions to his friend Antony, who paces beside the chariot, who moves slowly through the milling crowd. Antonio, Caesar, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep the night. Young Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Hear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well given. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. But I'd rather tell you what is to be feared than what I fear. For always, I am Caesar. Oh! Come on my right hand. For this ear is deaf. And tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. Brutus, you pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? I, Casca. Tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what hath chanced. Why, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand. Thus, and then the people fell a shouting. What was the second noise for? I, for that too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that too, Cassius. But the crown offered him twice? Why, that was. And he put it by thrice, every time, gentler than other. And at every putting by, mine honest neighbors shouted, who offered him the crown. Why, Antony, tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, and as I told you, he put it by once. Then he offered it to him again. Then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very low to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. He put it the third time by, and still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted, and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it had almost choked Caesar. For he swooned and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I durst not laugh, for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. Soft, I tell you. What? Did Caesar swoon? Huh. He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at mouth and was speechless. Very like. He had the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath it not. But you and I, an honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I'm sure Caesar fell down. What said he when he came unto himself? When he came to himself again, he said... If he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. And after that he came thus sad away? Ha! Ah. Aye. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Fare you well. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? Oh, no, I'm promised for. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive and your mind holds, and your dinner worth the eating. Good. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell both. What a blunt fellow this has grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. Good Cassius, for this time I leave you. Tomorrow, if you will, come home to me and I'll wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Farewell. Well, Brutus, thou art noble. Yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their lights. For who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now, and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him, or worse days endure. Now, night has fallen storm breaks over the capital. The seven hills are sapped with lightning. Thunder crashes and rolls unendingly above the city. Wind and stinging rain drive the superstitious Romans into their houses to cower in their beds. The shelter of a pillar stands Cassius. Another cloaked figure 
joins him stealthily. Who's there? A Roman. Casca, by your voice. Your ear is good. Cassius, what night is this? A very pleasing night to honest men. Whoever knew the heaven's menace. Those that have known the earth so full of faults. Now could I, Casca, name to thee a man most like this dreadful night, a man no mightier than thyself or me in personal action, yet prodigious grown and fearful as these strange eruptions are. This Caesar that you mean, is it not, Cassius? Let it be who it is. Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king, and he shall wear his crown by sea and land in every place save here in Italy. I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage will deliver Cassius. Therein ye gods you make the weak most strong. Therein ye gods you tyrants to defeat. Nor stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of Tyranid. That part of Tyranid that I do bear, I can shake off at pleasure. So can I. So every bondman in his own hand bears the power to cancel his captivity. Why should Caesar be a tyrant then? What crashes Rome, what rubbish, and what awful, when it serves for the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar. But, oh, grief, where hast thou led me? I perhaps speak this before a willing one. You speak to Casca, to such a man that is no fleering telltale. Hold my hand, be factious for redress of all these griefs, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farther. There's a bargain made. I'll know you, Casca. I have moved already some certain of the noblest-minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honorable, dangerous consequence. And I do know by this they stay for me in Pompey's porch. Come, Casca, you and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and the man entire upon the next encounter yields him ours. <laughs> It is now a few hours past midnight, and Brutus faces his orchard. The conspirators gather before Brutus' house. They go into him in a body, with the Cassius at their head. I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I've been up this hour, awake all night. Know why these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them. And no man here but honors you. And everyone doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. They are all welcome. Give me your hands all over, one by one. And let us swear our resolution. No, no, not an oath. What need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Casca! Well urged. I think it is not meet. Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar, which to prevent... Let Antony and Caesar fall together. Uh, Our cause would seem too bloody, Caius Cassius. To cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, not butchers, Cassius. Oh, that we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not view him as a carcass fit for hounds. And for Mark Anthony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. But it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or no, for he is superstitious grown of late. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night, and the persuasion of his augurers may hold him from the capital today. Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I can all sway him. Let me work, for I can give his humor the true bent, and I will bring him to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there to fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus. Good gentlemen. Look fresh and heavily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. And so, good morrow to you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Dawn is creeping over the Roman hills. 
This is the 15th day of March. The eyes of March. Caesar in his sumptuous palace paces the marble floor with fretful feet. The awful nights and the fears of his wife have played heavily upon his superstitious soul. Now there is a stir at the door and uh, Casca enters. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot this false. That I dare not, false, sir. I will not come today. Tell them so, Casca. Most mighty Caesar. Let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight... She saw my statue, which, like a fountain with an hundred spouts, did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent. And on her knee had begged that I would stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood. This, by Calpurnia's dream, is signified. And this way have you well expounded it. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, Lo, Caesar is afraid. Give me my robe, for I will go. And look where Trebonius has come to fetch me. <laughs> Welcome, Trebonius. <laughs> what, Brutus, are you stirred so early too? Aye. What is your clock? Caesar has struck an eight. I thank you for your pains and courtesy. <laughs> See, <laughs> Antony that revels long a night is not the standing up. Good morrow, Antony. Go to most noble Caesar. Bid them prepare within, and we, like friends, will straightway go together. <laughs> has gathered. Caesar stands before them at the foot of murdered Pompey's statue, surrounded by men with murder in their hearts. The time has now come for the presenting of petitions to all powerful Caesar. What is now amiss? That Caesar and his planet must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most wicked Caesar. Metellus Simba throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simba. These couchings and these lowly curtsies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn preordinance and first decree into the law of children. Thy brother, by decree, is banished. Is there no voice more worthy than mine own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand. What? Root of not in flattery, Caesar. Desiring thee that Publius Simba may have an immediate freedom of repeal. Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon. As low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star. Let me a little show it, even in this. That I was constant, Simba should be banished. And constant do remain to keep him so. Caesar! Oh, Caesar! Great Caesar! Hence! That's not Brutus, Brutus, the new speed hands for me! Get it! Freedom! Ah. <laughs> Ooh, Brutus! Ah, then all Caesar. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons on our heads, let's all cry peace, freedom, liberty! Stupid 
there, that horse. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now in Pompey's base lies alone no worthier than the dust? How often that shall be, so often shall the none of us be called the men that gave their country liberty. <laughs> Mark Antony, though now we must appear bloody and cruel as by our hands and this our present act you see we do, yet see you but our hands, our hearts you see not. For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude. Then we deliver to you the cause why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. Friends am I with you all and love you all. Upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Our reasons are so good and so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And am moreover suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace. And in the pulpit as becomes a friend... Speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, you know not what to do. Precious, by your pardon, I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. Mark Antony, here, take your Caesar's body, and you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going after my speech is ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body then and follow us. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of time. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do open their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall come where all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds. And Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Atte by his side, come hot from hell. Shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. That this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. <laughs> first part of Columbia's presentation of Julius Caesar with Claude Rains, Walter Abel, and Reginald Denny. The play will continue in just a moment. Continue with the second part of Julius Caesar with an all-star cast, including Claude Rains as Cassius, Thomas Mitchell as Brutus, Morris Ancrum as Anthony, Walter Abel as Casca, and Reginald Denny as Caesar. Conway Turl, the narrator, again comes forward to set the scene. The body of the murdered Caesar is being carried slowly into the forum through the seething multitude. Brutus, grave and imposing, walks ahead. The other conspirators, pale and uncertain of the mob's temper, are just behind. Antony, with downcast eyes, follows the body of his friend. We will be satisfied. Let us be satisfied. Brutus! Brutus! Silence! 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 
Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for my honor and have respect to my honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was none less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I love Caesar less, but that I love Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at him. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that he would be a bondman? If any speak, for him I have offended. Who is here so rude that he would not be a Roman? If any speak, for him I have offended. Who is here so vile that he will not love his country? If any speak, for him I have offended. I pause for reply. None of us, none Then none have I offended. I've done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses and force for which he suffered death. Here is his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth. As which of you shall not? And with this I depart. That as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. Let him be Caesar. Caesar's better part shall be found in Brutus. We'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamor. My countrymen, peace! Silence! Good, good countrymen. Let me depart alone, and for my sake stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech, which tending Caesar's glories that Mark Antony by our permission is allowed to make. I do entreat you. Not a man depart save I alone, till Antony have spoken. Friend. Roman countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often carried with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupico, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice 
refused. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here am I to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Or judgment how it fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with season, and I must pause till it come back to me. You think there's much reason in his sayings? If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong, has he not, Master? I fear there will be a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words, if he will not take the crown. Therefore, tis certain he was not ambitious. If it be found so, some will fear abide it. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire there's, with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Anthony. What yesterday? Now mark him. He begins again to speak. What yesterday? The word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there. And none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong, Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. This is will. Let but the commons hear this testament which pardon me. I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. I must not be. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. Yeah. Read the will. Read the will. Send to me. You shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have or shot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do hear it. They would treat us, honorable men. You will compel me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me a leave? Most noble Anthony. Hey, press not so upon me. Stand far off. Head back. Room. Head back. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time Caesar ever put it on. It was on a summer's evening. It was ten. That day he overcame the Nervii. Look. In this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him. Then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle, muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down 
whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, oh now you can. And I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself. Marred, as you see, with traitors. Oh, oh piteous spectacle. Oh, noble Caesar. Oh, woeful day. Oh, traitors. Oh, villains. Oh, bloody sight. We will be rescued. Let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. I am the orator as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Real mutiny! Burn the house! Away! And hear me! Yes, hear me speak! Why, friends, you have forgot the will I told you of. The will! And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, seventy-five drachmas. Most noble Caesar, we'll avenge his death. Oh, royal Caesar. He hath left to all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side of Tiber. He hath left the mule and to your heirs forever, common pleasures. To walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. Whence comes there such another? Now, mischief, thou art a foot. Take thou what force thou wilt. The people are plucking down the benches of the forum to build a funeral pyre for Caesar's body. A flame springs up, and then another. And in these sacrificial flames, all that is mortal of great Caesar disappears. But the pyre spreads out without over the land, consumed in its turn by the crater flame of civil war. On one side, Antony and Octavius. On the other, Brutus and Cassius. Brutus' noble dream of saving the Republic by murdering Caesar is quickly shattered. The conspirators are corrupt. Even Cassius is avaricious and quarrelsome. But the legions of Cassius and Brutus finally unite for battle against the enemy. Now the two leaders are quarreling in Brutus' tent. Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. Judge me, you gods. Wrong, I am in enemies. If not so, how should I wrong a brother? Brutus, this sober form of yours hides wrong. And when you do them, I shall... Be content. Speak your grief softly. Before the eyes of both our armies here, which should perceive nothing but love from us, let us not wrangle. That you have wronged me does appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians. But in my letters, praying on his side, because I knew the man was slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offense shall bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm, to sell and mark your officers for gold to undeservers. I, an itching palm, you know that you are Brutus that speak this, or by the gods this speech for else shall last. The name of Cassius honors this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement! Remember, March! The eyes of March, remember. Did not great Julius bleed for justice sake? What villain touched his body that it stabbed and not for justice? What 
Shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers? Shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large fortunes for so much trash as may be grasped at us? I'd rather be a dog and bear a moon than such a Roman. Oh, this may not be. I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hit me, and I am a soldier. I, older in practice, abler than yourself to make conditions. Go to your nut, Cassius. I am. I say you're not. Urge me no more. I shall forget myself. Have mind upon your health. Tempt me no further. Away, slight man. <laughs> from this day forth, I'll use you for my mirth. Yea, for my laughter. When you are wasp. Is it come to this? You say you're a better soldier. Let it appear so. Make the vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For my own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me every way. You wrong me, Brutus. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he does not thus move me. Peace, peace. You does not so have tempted him. I does not. No. What does not tempt him? For your life, you does not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that, I shall be sorry for. You have done that you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass me by as the idle wind which I respect not. I did send to you for certain sums of gold which you denied me, but I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I'd rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send to you for gold to pay my legions, which you denied me. Was that done by Cassius? Should I have answered Caius Cassius so? When Marcus Brutus grows so covetous as to lock such rascal counters from his friends, be ready, he gods, with all your thunderbolts to dash him to pieces. I denied you not. You did. I did not. He was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus hath drived my heart. A friend to bear his friend's infirmities. But Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could never see such faults. Us flatterers would not, though they do appear as high as you to Olympus. Come, Antony, and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius. For Cassius is a weary of the world, hated by one he loves, brave by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, learned and conned by rope to cast into my teeth. Oh, I could weep my spirit from my eyes. There is my dagger. And here, my naked breast. Within a heart, nearer than Pluto's mine, richer than gold, if that thou beest a Roman, take it forth. I that deny thee gold will give my heart strike as thou didst at Caesar. For I know when thou didst hate him worse, thou lovest him better than ever thou lovest Cassius. Sheathe your dagger, be angry when you will, it shall have scope. Do what you will, dishonor shall be humor. Oh, Cassius, you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire, who, when enforced, shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again. As Cassius lives to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus, when grief and blood ill-tempered vexes him. When I spoke that, I was ill-tempered too. Do you confess so much? Give me your hand. And my heart too. Oh, Brutus. What's the matter? Have you not love enough to bear with me? When that rash humor which my mother gave me makes me forgetful. Yes, Cassius. And from henceforth, when you are over earnest with your Brutus, he'll think your mother chides and leave you so. Lucius, a bowl of wine. I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius, I'm sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accident. No. No man bears sorrow better. Portia, my wife, is dead. Portia? She's dead. How escaped I kill him when I crossed you, sir? Oh, insupportable and touching loss. Upon what sickness? Impatience of my absence and grief that young Octavius and Mark Antony have made themselves so strong. With this she fell distracted in her attendant's absence. Swallowed fire. And died so? Even so. Oh, ye mortal gods. Speak no more of her. 
give me a bowl of wine. In this, I bury all unkindness, Cassius. My heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. Fill Lucius till the wine or swell the cup. I cannot drink too much of Brutus' love. Oh, my dear brother, this was an ill beginning of the night. Never come such division between our souls. Let it not fruit us. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Brutus, if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will be bound to Rome. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why, then this parting was well made. Forever and forever, farewell, Peter. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, it's true. This parting was well made. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omit it. All the voyage of their life is bound in shallow and in misery. At Philippi, the forces loyal to dead Caesar clash with the legions of the conspirators. All day long the battle rages, and slowly but surely the tide turns in favor of Antony and Octavius. Even in death, the genius of mighty Caesar seems to guide his avengers to victory. The forces of Brutus and Cassius are divided. They're thrown back. Cassius' legions desert. He tries vainly to rally them. Oh, look! I see it! Heaven and sky! Myself have my own turned enemy. The ensign here of mine was turning back. I slew the coward and did take it from him. Oh, Cassius. Brutus gave the word too early. Who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil, whilst we, by Antony, are all enclosed. Fly further off, my lord. Fly further off. Mark Antony is in your tents, my lord. Fly, therefore, noble Cassius. Fly far off. This hill is far enough. Look, look, Titanius. Are those my tents when I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Titanius, if thou lovest me, mount thou my horse, and hide thy spurs in him till he have brought me up to yon troops and here again, that I may rest assured whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a fox. Oh, Pinterest, get higher on that hill. My sight was ever thick. Regard, Titanius, and tell me what thou knowest about the sea. This day I breathe it first. Time is come round. And where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run its compass. Sarah, what news? Oh, my lord. What news? Titanius is enclosed and round about with horsemen that make to him on the spur. Yes. Jack these spurs on. Now they're almost on him. Now, Titanius, what news? He's They shout for joy. Come down, come down. Behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long, to see my best friend tamed before my face. Come hither, sirrah. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner. And then I swore thee, saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath. Thou be a freeman. And with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels, search this bosom. Stand not to answer. Here, take thou the hilts. And when my face is covered, as it is now, guide thou the sword. Caesar, thou art revenged. Even with the sword. 
Not his body lie. No, yonder. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. The last of all the Romans, fare thee well. It's impossible that Rome should ever breathe thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Come, poor remains of friends. Rest on this rock. Come hither. Good Volumnius. List a word. What says the Lord? Good Volumnius. Thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that our love of old, I prithee, hold thou my sword hilt, whilst I run upon it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Well, farewell to you. There is no tarrying here. Farewell, my lord. My heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man, but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day. More than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. I pray thee, straight up, stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of good respect. Thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword, and turn away thy face, while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, straight up, give me your hand first? Fare you well, my lord. Farewell. Good straight. Your oh. honor. Caesar. Now be still. I kill love thee. With half so good a will. Died thy master, Plato. Oh, Anthony, I held the sword and Brutus did run on it. So Brutus should be found. For Brutus only overcame himself. And no man else has honor by his death. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only in a general honest thought and common good to all made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Just fallen on Columbia's presentation of Julius Caesar, and the audience has packed Columbia's Music Box Theater in Hollywood is affording a tremendous ovation to the actors whose brilliant performances they have just witnessed. Claude Rains, who played Cassius, Morris Angstrom, who was Anthony, Thomas Mitchell, who took the part of Brutus, Walter Abel, who appeared as Tosca, and Reginald Denny as Julius Caesar, together with Conway Turrell, the narrator, and the entire supporting cast are stepping towards the footlights to acknowledge their applause. In tonight's performance of Julius Caesar, the music was directed by Victor Bay. The play was adapted for radio and produced by Brewster Morton. Claude Rains, whose most recent picture is titled They Won't Forget, appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Pictures Incorporated. Next week, Columbia presents one of the gayest and most mirth-provoking comedies in the English tongue, Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew. This is the love story of a strong man who married a beautiful but shrewish woman. The Trucchio who tames the shrew will be played by Edward G. Robinson. Katharina, the woman whose fiery spirit is subdued, will be played by Frida Innescourt. And Charles Brown of Broadway fame will play Christopher Sly. 
The play has been specially adapted for radio by the distinguished author and critic, Mr. Gilbert Seldes. Remember the date, next Monday night. Same time, same station. Edward G. Robinson with a brilliant supporting cast in The Taming of the Shrew.